I want a toast. To Italy, of course. To the food, of course. And to love. To love. So All right, buckle up, because today we are diving into Speak No Evil. And let me tell you, this is not your run-of-the-mill horror flick. It's definitely got everyone talking, and for good reason. There's something about this film that gets under your skin. A lot of different opinions out there, too. Which is exactly why we're doing a deep dive on this one. We've got three totally different takes to unpack. A screenwriting analysis from Script Shadow, a classic film critic's perspective from RogerEbert.com, and to shake things up, we've got a genre fan's review from IGN. Talk about a mixed bag. It sounds like Speak No Evil really throws viewers for a loop. Yeah, it's a wild ride. The basic premise seems pretty straightforward family vacation goes wrong, but all three of our sources agree that there's something much more unsettling going on beneath the surface. And what's interesting is that it's the how that seems to set this film apart. It's not relying on the typical horror tropes. Exactly. Script Shadow, who approaches this from a screenwriter's perspective, was really impressed with how Speak No Evil uses scene construction to build that tension. They specifically point to the dinner table scene. Oh, now that's one that sticks with you. For those who haven't seen it, what happens during this dinner scene? Why is it so effective? So picture this. You're on vacation, meeting another family for the first time. Pretty normal, right? But then this other family starts acting out this really weird, almost uncomfortable role play scenario, and it just hangs there. Script Shadow points out that you're not sure if it's a joke, some cultural difference you don't understand, or if something much darker is at play. That ambiguity, that feeling of something's off, but I can't quite place it, it's unsettling, to say the least. And it plays into what RogerEber.com, our film critic, picked up on, too. They highlight how the film taps into those very human fears of social discomfort. Like, we've all had those awkward encounters where you're not sure what to do or say. Well, Speak No Evil takes that feeling and cranks it up to 11. You're on edge constantly because it feels so plausible. Like, this could actually happen. And just when you think it can't get any worse, Script Shadow mentions this other scene, the ladder scene. One of the main characters has to climb this old rickety ladder, and the dad from the other family is holding it. Or is he really going to hold it, you know? So we've got this constant feeling of unease. It's like the film takes these ordinary situations, things we encounter every day, and it twists them just enough to make you squirm. You said earlier that this film gets under your skin and it sounds like these scenes are a big part of how they do that. Oh, absolutely. On the surface, it's so simple. But the way they shoot it, the pacing, even the acting, it creates this crescendo of dread. And Script Shadow argues that it's this focus on everyday anxieties that makes Speak No Evil stand out. It's not about some supernatural entity. It's about the monsters hiding in plain sight, the ones you'd least expect. And you mentioned earlier, this film really seems to divide people. Some are calling it brilliant. Others are just totally creeped out. I'm curious, where does IGN, a resident genre fan, land in all of this? All this slow burning tension, these everyday situations turn scary. It's a lot. Well, IGN's headline pretty much sums her up. You'll still see and hear plenty of evils, don't worry. They did not hold back, called the ending, insurmountable despicableness, and went as far as to say the film takes a scorched earth approach to entertainment. Wow, they really went there. Sounds like the bleakness and the just plain disturbing elements of the film really turned them off. What do the other reviews say about the ending? Were they just as put off by it? It's interesting you use that word bleakness. RogerEbert.com actually pointed out that the American version, the one we're talking about, has a less bleak ending than the original Danish film. Wait, hold on. A less bleak ending? How is that even possible? It seems like the filmmakers wanted to give American audiences something a little more, shall we say, conventional, a resolution, even if it's still pretty messed up. So less everybody dies and more, well, that was horrific, but at least. Exactly. But even with that adjustment, both Script Shadow and RogerEbert.com agree that the ending, while brutal, isn't gratuitous. It serves the larger themes of the film. Okay, that's somewhat reassuring, I think. But how does it do that? What are those themes? I mean, aside from scaring the living daylights out of us, of course. This is where RogerEbert.com really digs deep. They draw this fascinating parallel between the structure of the film and the dynamics of an abusive relationship. They point out that the Daltons, our family on vacation, keep getting these chances to get away, to just walk away from this situation that's clearly not right. But they don't. They make excuses. They ignore the warning signs. They stay even when every instinct is screaming at them to run. See, now that's frustrating to watch. I haven't even seen this movie, and I can already feel that tension. And that's the point. The film isn't shying away from that discomfort. It's forcing you to confront it. Why do they make the choices they make? 
and by extension, it makes us think about how we would react. Would we be so quick to dismiss those red flags, or would we be yelling at the screen for them to get out while they still can? Okay, so we're definitely dealing with something that goes way deeper than your average slasher flick. But script shadow, on the other hand, they're not as interested in the psychological aspect. They're looking at how the film functions as a story. They keep mentioning this term, war wins above replacement. Right. It's a baseball term script shadow uses to talk about screenwriting. Yeah. Essentially, they're asking, what does this film, this scene, this character do that elevates it beyond your typical horror movie? So what makes Speak No Evil a home run, so to speak? For script shadow, it's that scene construction we talked about earlier. It's the way Speak No Evil takes these completely ordinary situations, a dinner party, driving in a car, a lost toy, and injects them with this almost unbearable tension. They were particularly impressed with that scene where the creepy dad is singing along to Eternal Flame by the Bengals. Apparently it's hilarious, but like in the most messed up way possible. Exactly. It's unexpected, it's darkly funny, and it's definitely memorable. And that's what they mean by war. It's those moments of originality that elevate Speak No Evil from a decent thriller into something truly unforgettable, even if it's a little hard to stomach. And I'm guessing the unforgettable, though very controversial ending factors into that war score as well. For sure. It's a bold choice, one that's going to get people talking, debating even. And really, isn't that the mark of any great piece of art? It should provoke a reaction. It should stay with you long after it's over. So we've got this film, Speak No Evil, and it's clearly well made, totally messes with your head and sparks all kinds of debate. What I'm finding so interesting is that it uses horror, but it's really holding up a mirror to how we act with each other day to day. Those little social anxieties we all feel. It's true. This isn't about ghosts or demons. It's about that feeling you get when you're not sure if you're overreacting or if something is truly deeply wrong. Which brings us back to what RogerEbert.com said about abusive relationships. They said the Daltons, the family on vacation, have this blind faith in the other family. But are they just naive or is there something else going on, something more deliberate? That's what makes the comparison to abusive relationships so powerful. It's like these monsters. They're hiding in plain sight. They're playing by the rules, at least at first. It's insidious. They know how to use our good nature against us. Our politeness, those times we second-guess ourselves, it's like they exploit that. And suddenly you're caught in this nightmare because you were just trying not to be rude. That sends chills down my spine just hearing you say that. And it makes me think about that other scene script shadow described, the one with the tongue, you know. Ugh. It's not just the shock value, it's this ultimate betrayal of trust. Exactly. The evil isn't always obvious. It doesn't announce itself with flashing lights. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's quiet, it lends in, and that's what makes it so terrifying. So what are we supposed to do with this? I mean, are people going to watch this movie and be afraid to talk to their neighbors? Maybe Speak No Evil is a cautionary tale. But it's not just about being careful who you trust. It's about trusting your gut. Those instincts you have, those red flags, listen to them. So next time I feel that little voice saying, this is weird, I should just channel my inner IGN reviewer and make a run for it. <laughs> it can't hurt, right? But seriously, I think Speak No Evil really forces us to think about what we're willing to put up with in the name of being polite. At what point do you say, nope, this just feels wrong, I'm out of here? It's a powerful message. And one that definitely adds a whole new layer to the film. I think you've officially convinced me to add speak no evil to my watch list. Might need a nightlight, though. And when you do watch it, let me know what you think. Did it stick with you? Did it make you question things, see the world a bit differently? I have a feeling it might. That's the thing about good storytelling. It gets under your skin, sparks these conversations, makes us think. And on that note, we'll leave you with that thought. <laughs> Until next time, happy viewing, everyone.